It's my great pleasure to introduce Terry Haste, co-founder of Kent Haste. Um, Mr. Haste, you've had quite the illustrious career on Savile Row. I, I reached out to you because uh, we watched Batman recently and knowing that you'd done some work on the, on the Batman films, um, I was keen to get your side of the story. But before we get to that, perhaps just a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of you, please, sir, and uh, how you got your start on Savile Row. Yeah, it was quite interesting, really. I always wanted to be a tailor from as far back as I can remember. There was never any other thing for me, so I knew I wanted to be a tailor. But it was very, very difficult finding a way in. And luckily enough, one Friday, my dad, who was a carpenter, saw it in the paper about Moss Bros. So he phoned up Manny Silverman, who then we went and saw him on a Saturday, and he arranged me to speak to someone at Huntsman on a Saturday. We went over and saw them, and then I just walked into Anderson Shepherd after that. I was 15 at the time, and Anderson Shepherds took me on as a apprentice trouser cutter at the time. Okay, and then from Anderson and Shepherd, you went to Halls and Curtis. Is that correct? I went to a little place called Chapman. He's not around anymore. He's he's from your Kent friends. Fame. He was a cutter with them, and he started on his own in one of the smallish uh, units opposite the biggest stores on Savile Row and I was with him for a while and then I went to another company called Demon and Goddard which were on Sackville Street actually just up from where we are now and it was a pretty bad time actually for tailoring and I just got married and literally just got back from my honeymoon and they made me redundant and that's how one of the cloth merchants introduced me to Hawes and Curtis the infamous Teddy Watson at Horse and Curtis. So I took, that's where I met John. And John and I remain you know, amazingly good friends right throughout our whole life. And that's John Kent, John. Uh, your, your business business partner for uh, Kent Hayes. <laughs> wow, so that, that friendship's been forged for, for quite a while now. I know, we're very similar. I mean, he taught me a lot of my cutting. So all right, I cut more like the Huntsman now, but it's our cutting style is very, very similar. Right. And maybe you can just touch, touch upon the, the transition from Hawes and Curtis. I, I, I'm sorry that we're just going to just completely accelerate through from your 20-year uh, history of several row cutting, but you started yeah. work for... Uh, yeah. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Hawes and Curtis in them days was owned by... Tur were owned by Watson sold out to Turnbull and Asser. So we were owned by Turnbulls and... You know, John had left and it was too young for me to take over, it really was. I left and joined Savoy Taylor's Guild in the, in the Strand, right next door to Savoy Hotel, which I was there for about seven years. I mean, it was a brilliant time there, actually, but I just wanted to get back on Savile Row. And Tommy had asked me to join him when he first opened the new store in 19 Savile Row. And we couldn't agree on a price the wage so I stayed where I was and then Jim the other cutter there left and then he asked me again and we we, we could work out price and I went to work for Tommy and that, that's how I ended up with Tommy Nutter it was a very similar cutting style because it was based on again on the, the Kilgar French cutting style which is a squarer shoulder a more sharper shoulder yeah and, and what <laughs> And, and was so at this time, what year are we talking now? 1986. Okay. And is so just to give me kind of the landscape, is Edward Sexton still on board at this point or had he moved on? Oh, no, no. That was Sexton and Chilabara Morgan were all at a cup shop called Nutters, which was financed by Cilla Black and Peter Brown. But when that sort of went haywire, um, well, Tommy had gone and he, I think he'd done a little bit for went back to Kilgars and done a little bit of Kilgars and then he sort of didn't do too much and then Alan Lewis who used to own Huddersfield Fine Worcester I think he still owns Crombie I think he put the money up for Tommy to open the new store on 19 Savile Road which was then under his name Tommy Nutter right thing was Nutters that was I think Chittabara Morgan still owned this the Nutters um name right Okay, and and that, so at eighty nine, the well, actually, before we just get back to get on to Batman, I was going to ask what kind of person Tommy was to work for. I mean, you must have known him obviously before then, but to actually 
work for him. What are your what are your memories of working for Tommy? Uh, Tommy's brilliant. I mean, we had a great. It was it was just a great laugh all the time. He'd go to work and it wasn't like oh, I've got to go to work today. It was like he would just go to work. He was enjoying yourself. He was brilliant to work for. He was no hard taskmaster. He didn't get told off. We had a you know wonderful team there. There's two salesmen, Tommy, the designer, and uh, yeah, I had an apprentice as well, and it, it was just brilliant. We had a great tailors. You know, tailors were all downstairs in the basement. It was a wonderful team, and some of them are still with me today. So the tailors, you know, stay with you for the entirety of your lifestyle. Right, and and how hands-on was he um, in the store by this point? He was, kind of... he was there the whole time, always. Right. Monday to Saturday, we'd be there, what, 9 till 5.30. Yeah, you know, I think he stayed on at night as well. Right. He went on in the evenings. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Batman production come knocking around about 89. Can you remember any of the initial conversations or or who talked to who around that time? Uh, it was um, Bob Ringwood was a designer for the clothing on the Batman film. So it wasn't designed by Tommy, although it was made in the Tommy Nutter style, which is this, you know, bigger shoulders, the wider shoulders with the, the bigger chest and very slim through the hips. But so basically the initial talks were between Bob Ringwood and Tommy. And, and then it became Bob Ringwood and obviously me, because we then had to get down to the technical side of, how everything was going to come together because if you've have you seen the drawings from the film i have yes yeah i mean if you see that the morning coat for instance it's not really like the pictures at all is it because um person wasn't that shape and immediately see there's no way we could get that to him and you know when it comes to the overcoat he jack nicholson wanted a particular style of overcoat as well which was very similar to our house style but it was slightly different to the pictures but Bob was, yeah, he was great to work with, really. There's no, no issues whatsoever. I heard that some of the designs were, like you mentioned, perhaps just a little bit too ambitious to yeah. make a reality. <laughs> so what was, how did you kind of meet in the middle with that? What was possible and what was just off the table? I just, just done what I wanted, really. No, Bob, he was quite, Bob was really good. I mean, Tommy really didn't say too much he left it all to me but you know, Bob he just let me get on with it I just say to him well I can't do it I, I just can't get to that style it's just he's never going to be able to carry that or wear that or carry that off so it just it just evolved really you know with the fittings we went over to Los Angeles to his to Jack Nicholson's house to do the fittings and it just evolved from there really Oh, wow. And what was that like? That must have been an exciting introduction. Had you met him before? No, I've never met him before. No. I mean, yeah. No. It was, yeah, it was pretty good. We went, he lives, obviously, here. I mean, you know where he lives. He lives up on in the hills. So we went up there. But, I mean, he made us all welcome. Went up with the, the hairdresser and a couple of the production assistants and the stylists. And me and Jack Nicholson went off into a bedroom and done the fittings, just literally me and him. Uh, you know, while he was there, he showed me just finished Witches of Eastwick. So he he showed me some of the outfits he used on Witches of Eastwick. Um, ones he kept because obviously they were purple, and he kept the purple ones because he was a Lakers fan. I think he was a co-owner of Lakers. I think I'm not quite sure, but and he he loved purple. So <laughs> and he just made us all feel incredibly welcome. Yeah, some of those outfits, I think. Was it Nino Ceruti did some of those outfits for? Yeah, it was just the coats he kept. I mean, it was just the, obviously he wanted to wear the top coats when he goes to the basketball, I suppose. Right. OK, I didn't know that. That's interesting. And c can you recall what kind of influence uh, Jack was having or was he kind of trying to gild the lily and ask for a few things? Was there anything that stood out for you that he was asking for in this in these designs? No, he was, he was, it's very easy going, really. He just went with it how it was. I mean, it was, it was just the main thing was the overcoat, really, because he obviously wanted to use it afterwards for himself. So we had to do extra overcoat so he could have one for himself. And it, it was just something that he wanted one. That's what he wanted. Um, but no, everything else, he just really left it to us. And you know, we went, when we finished the fittings after about an hour, he went back into 
see the hairdresser and he put his hair back, he brushed his hair back and done the you know the Joker sort of stance. He was like getting into the the part already. So he was really good. He just said, I can walk around the house, do what you want, you know. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. I mean, were you a, a Nicholson fan at this point? I mean, he's kind of well into his career, right? So I wasn't at all actually. I, I wasn't mad on his acting, but I think he was absolutely brilliant in that film, and I've seen him a few films since then. I think he's been absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, at, by this point yourself, Terry, you're not a stranger to celebrity or the world no. of rock stars and films. So, uh, I guess you've been quite conditioned at this point. Yeah. I mean, when you're in tailoring, I mean, obviously, luckily for me, the top end of tailoring, you, you meet so many, so many people from you know rock stars to royalty. It's, it's like everybody really and so you just get used to you get used to it I mean they're, they're no different to you or I they're exactly the same and they're all very very friendly well most of them are you get one or two that are not very friendly but nine out of ten are incredibly friendly because they they want a decent a really nice suit as well that's why they're coming to you so they're not going to upset you are they <laughs> yeah. and did you make any of the suits for Jack Nicholson as Jack Napier, so the character outside of the Joker, or did you just make the, the suit? Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Oh, in fact, in the film, everything barring, I think there was one black dinner suit, which we didn't make. I think that was put in as an extra scene afterwards, and we didn't make that one, but literally everything was made. So it's the, the blue suit where he first started off, and there was we made four of those. Um, the next suit, which was like a, a plum colour, I think it was, wasn't it? Like an aubergine plummy sort of. Yeah. We made eight of them, which I never understood why we made so many of that particular one, because it was a very short transition between that one and the the purple striped suit, which was exactly the same cloth, but in a more of a purple colour. And we made four of the purple ones, and then we made five of the towel coats, which is the one he spent most of the time in the in those ones, and <clears throat> it's quite interesting. All the cloths were made specially for the film. I mean, they've done tremendously well to source the fabrics and get it all dyed specially and get all the stripes made specially because they wanted something to be really striking. And the buttons on the waistcoat were actually made out of cufflinks. They um, broke them all down. They <clears throat> obviously had to get a lot of cufflinks because there was five you know, five sets of them. Yeah, I noticed the cufflinks, especially in some of the scenes when he's at the museum, wrecking the museum, meeting Kim Bassinger. You get a yeah. nice close-up shot of like a, a little deck of cards that have unfurled. Um, I don't. Were they supplied by you as well? No, 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 no Bob Greenwood, and he he done all that. He got the buttons. Were as say the four suits, weren't they, on the buttons, on the waistcoat? I mean, it's all right. No, I don't know where. He, he found a load of cufflinks and then had them, as they made its buttons. And can you remember, like, the budget for these sort of productions? Are, they, are you given, like, you know, yeah. sky's the limit, just make sure it looks good type thing, or are they kind of scrounging around? No, they, I know exactly. They were £330 per hour, which was way under the price, but Tommy agreed to do them. Um, for, and this is a suit, not, not just a garment? Per suit, whichever one. 330 per suit. Yeah, so the morning suit was exactly the same as the lounge suits, for instance. And the cashmere overcoat was exactly the same. I think when we did Commissioner Gordon, he had um, yeah, not a cashmere overcoat. <laughs> yeah. He had a cashmere overcoat and that, I think they that was charged a lot more. And then... We, we had that four ready-to-wear suits for the guys who got burnt round the table. They had the Tommy Nutter iconic waistcoats on, you know, the moray silk waistcoat. And uh, the black striped suits, they were our ready-to-wear range, which they had. And so did you say you also made the uh, suits for the other actors, so like Michael Keaton as well? And, and um, uh, Michael Keaton was... had his, he was an, um, a great Armani lover at the time, so all his stuff come from Armani. Oh, OK, because I saw a couple of names in the credits that I didn't recognise and I looked them up and Googled them, some Italian name. Uh, kind of, I, the names escape me now, but they were 
said that men's were selected by these labels, but there's literally no trace of them online. So I, ma I imagine they've kind of disappeared since. Um, I'll send you I'll send you the names afterwards so <laughs> see if it jogs any memories. But, um, anyway, that's I digress. Um, Terry, I was going to ask, did you go to Pinewood at all? Because this was quite close to you. Did you go down for any fittings or see any of the production? No, no, we no. I, I was going to take my son, and then it, it didn't quite happen to spend the day down there, but that didn't quite happen. Um, but I did. Yeah, I did go to Pinewood once. I went. Yeah, I did actually. I went to Pinewood once just to do a fitting with Jack Nicholson in just in in the studio. Uh, you know, in, in his room. And he came into the shop once as well, because he unfortunately put a little bit of weight on between fitting and coming into the shop and trying them on again. Oh, he, really? He said to me, you'll notice I haven't put any weight on. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just let him out then for something to do. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I mean, so what you, you told me offline that you also went to see this with your son at the cinema. So this must have been quite yeah. an experience for you to see those clothes on the screen, a real proud moment. I bet you can even remember the cinema you went to. Yeah, it was on in Leicester Square, they were showing the preview. So we were, went to Leicester Square to see it with my son and my wife at the time. And it was, yeah, it was, it was brilliant seeing them all on screen because they really come alive on screen, especially when you know the show, you know, the story with them as well. I mean, the last scene when he was with Kim Bassinger, when his hands fell off, I don't know, do you remember that one? Uh, yeah, when he says, take a hand and the, the hand yeah. comes off, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that suit came back to us and we had to put extra long sleeves in, because obviously there's no way, I suppose they could do it now with um, on computer, but at the time, so we had to put these extra, you know, five inch longer sleeves in, so <laughs> his hands obviously holding sticks on, inside it. Ah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that makes sense. You've got sleeves for that as well. <laughs> so, oh, really? <laughs> oh, fascinating. I mean, the, so when you make these suits, I guess they all then go out. None of these come back to you to keep and get put in your archives at all. Which I did. But I think one sold recently for about 70000 didn't it, at auction? I'll have to look that up. I'm, I'm, maybe, the, maybe the jacket. No, it was the purple towel suit. Oh, right, the purple tail suit. Oh, a year and a half ago at auction. You know what always, uh, what really stood out also watching it were the trousers. I mean, just the kind of the fabric on these pleated, like the purple blue checks. I mean, can you remember making those at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were, were quite wide, the trousers, so pleated trousers, uh, quite wide. But the, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a huge check. It's very nice. It was exactly the same cloth as all of it. It wasn't the greatest fabric in the world. It was like a hop sack weave uh, yeah they were very white because you wanted that it was that 40s 30s and 40s look wasn't it uh, the, I, sorry. yeah I was, no no I was just gonna say the the film to me had a very film noir feel to it it, it didn't kind of identify with like 80s fashion at all it didn't no. Oh, no. And I'm sure that was intended. There was no kind of product placement to let you know, oh, here's Coca-Cola, just to let you know that Coca-Cola on board, for example. So it really did have its own world. You were kind of really sucked into that world for it. And I think the clothes really made that a timeless world as well. Yeah, the, I mean, the clothes, I, I love making it. It was a hell of a lot of garments to make in a very short time. So everybody was working very hard at, on it. Um, but yeah, everyone had a great time. And Obviously, everyone was really proud telling everybody they're making for it. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet. Um, have Have you uh, been in touch with Jack since? Does he Does he drop by at all? No, was that the? No, no it was just the production. Probably mm -hmm. done. Um, it's probably just done. You know, does so many films, doesn't he? He's probably see so many tailors. So. Well, I mean, you you. The suits looked fantastic. It was a real pleasure to revisit this film, but through the prism of like a, well, critiquing it menswear wise, it was just a real, real treat to see these suits on screen. They really came to life. So thanks for taking us down memory lane, Terry, with uh, some Batman talk. I'm always curious to know if there's any films personally that either you've worked on or outside of Batman that you look at and you go, wow, that's a really stylish film. Love the suits in that. They've done a great job. No, it's always nice to look at look at a lot of the old black and white films because you see some of the films going back to the 
the 50s I just love looking at the designs looking at the styles and you pick out certain little things I and mean, you look at Fred Astaire you look at some of his clothing in some of the films the, the guy I used to dance with recently was talking with John you know, my partner at work we was talking about the sports jacket he was wearing about doing something like that but yeah it's just looking at just looking at different films look at styling there's some really great clothing out there you know, that's made for some of these films but it's yeah it's it's all changed now isn't it it's all about product placement now isn't it so a lot of these people are having suits you know if you look at the James Bond the original ones which were uh, Sinclair and Haywood and people like that, they were that was their tailors that's why they went to them but now it's all about who's going to pay I suppose to get in the, to production well, that's the question that I was going to lead on to, Terry, um, and I'm I'm going to put you on the spot with this, but do you think films and franchises like, say, the James Bond one could come back to the row and ask for these amount of duplicates, you know, because like the likes of, say, Tom Ford can kind of farm these clothes out, maybe they'll get some other house to, to produce them under the Tom Ford name, for example, but would, would that, like for you, for example, would you be able to go and do the amount of duplicates needed for such a blockbuster these days. Yeah, you can do. We did some for the, you know, Taron Edgerson in his last film, was it Kingsman? We done clothes for him in that film. But it's very difficult with film works. It's all it's all about budget now, and I don't think they're going to come back to sell or again anymore because it's all about product placement now, isn't it? As you said, with Coca Cola on the site in in the film shop so unless they, they actually turn around and say well i really need want that suit by that particular guy i don't think it's going to happen again yeah i was actually just speaking to chris kerr over down at soho um and he was talking about the ndas that he has to sign because some films and some places don't want that alignment um and he's fine with it he's he's, he's happy for the work he kind of signs and then doesn't yeah. And he goes, he'd love to talk about a lot of the work that he, he gets asked to do, but, you know, they don't want that association half the time. No, that stuff's made now. And obviously, because they're selling ready to air range off of it, aren't they? So they obviously don't want your name on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Terry, it's been a, it's a real joy talking to you. First time talking to you. And thanks so much for taking time out on the weekend. Um, people can have an appointment for you, I guess, through the website kenthaste.co.uk we'll leave all the details there how how is the schedule at the minute now that people are being loud out no it's, it's actually quite nice we're seeing a lot of people come in now so it's it seems to be getting busy this week was much much busier than last week and the week before but it's nice to get normal again now hope well let's hope we're going to get back to normal we can't do any traveling yet and as you probably know most of us do a hell of a lot of traveling nowadays going you know, to the continent and to America but unfortunately we can't do any of that at the moment so we've got a lot of stuff hanging about ready to go out to America. And how are, pe are people phoning in their appointments or sending you measurements kind of virtually? We've done a f yeah we've done no not measurements we've done a few most of our new people obviously want to come in and be measured and everything so that's obviously going to have to be put on hold and wait till they can come in but with people we've made for before, we send patterns out, they send choices they want, they tell us they put weight on or lost weight. We, what we've done during the lockdown is we've sent garments out at the fitting stage and then do a call like we're doing now with you, um, do it on a WhatsApp and I'll just say to the person's wife or whoever's with him, tell them exactly what to do, put us, how to put the suit on and then we just go through it that way. And we done one on Thursday with a, a guy in Russia. The, the, exactly the same way. His wife was holding the phone. We'd tell her where to point the phone. And then we, we just take screenshots as, as we're doing it. And it's, it's worked out. It's worked out pretty good so far. Right. OK, well, I guess we all have to kind of adapt and yeah. augment. And uh, I mean, it, everything would be ideal if they came into the shop or you were to go to them. But, you know, in these sort of situations, um, yeah, I guess you have to kind of make do with things. Uh, 
Terry, I could speak to you all day. I'd love to speak to you all day, but I appreciate you've got a life to lead outside of this. So I'll let you, I'll let you go. But um, please come on the show anytime you like, if, you, if you'd like to talk about any other films or any other things that inspired you. Thanks very much.